Is President Trump as popular as he was when he declared Jerusalem to be the capital? Is he still as popular? He could probably become prime minister of Israel. Really? <laughs> He's so okay. popular. Yeah. So his He's popularity. way more popular in Israel than he is the, in the United States. Mm-hmm. Uh, last I checked, I think he had an 80 percent popularity rating in the state of Israel. Hmm. And, and he's done a lot to deserve that. Hi, I'm Pete Santilli. Okay, we'll take a, uh, a, a break from our weekly and daily news, uh, as we always do in the second hour, where we, we bring to our show some of the most interesting guests that, uh, I mean, I, I'm just thinking about it actually before we're coming on. Um, over 2,000 episodes that we've done, hundreds and hundreds of very interesting guests. And this is uh, my next guest's first visit to the show. Let me tell you who he is and why you should definitely stay tuned here for this this segment with Dr. Kenneth Hansen. He's a scholar of Hebrew language, literature, and the history of the Jewish people from ancient times through the Holocaust and beyond. Uh, Dr. Hansen is a Ph.D., He's a coordinator of the Judaic Studies at the University of Central Florida in Orlando. He's passionate about his research of the ancient world. And Dr. Hansen carries his ecumenical message beyond the scholarly boundaries in which they were once held captive. His appearances on syndicated radio and national television, the History Channel, uh, have brought ancient insight into everyone's world. He's a recipient of wide accolades from print media, and in great demand as a popular lecturer, um, Dr. Hansen is a frequent guest on radio and TV talk shows in various parts of the country. And that's why we're so honored to have him on live on the Pete Santilli Show. Sir, thank you very much for joining me. It is your first visit here. But I'm very, very uh, interested to speak with you about your area of discipline. And good to be with you, Pete. And warm shalom from Orlando, Florida, the University of Central Florida. Shalom. Baruch atah Adonai Aluhenu. Fantastic. Wow. See, now God understands you. Yes. Yes, he does. And I, I didn't plan to do that, by the way. That was spoken it right from deep in my just soul. Came out, just came, came out of the of the nishama, the soul, as we say. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Welcome and shalom. Um, you know, let, let me tell you uh, who I am and and. By the way, I'm a recovering Roman Catholic, as I call myself, but I'm a Christian. And I've always been a believer, even just as a political commentator, uh, as a very spiritual uh, man, as I have been all of my life, as a conservative Republican. Ultimately, I've always centered around what I know to be God's commandments in defending the Holy Land of Israel. So then you can tack on politics around that and a lot of world history and politics of interfered with that beautiful holy land but god has given his commandments it is written in in the in the in the scriptures uh in the in the torah uh, and i especially want to speak with you uh about a couple of uh sects out of the uh the middle eastern religions that is that have tried to i guess compromise uh the the holy land itself um but, but, sir, from, from, that, from that basis, that's where I'm at, just to let you know where, where I come from. I believe that the government of Israel is probably just as divided as the United States of America and Democrats and Republicans. And as you, a matter of fact, it is. Right? But that's, that's democracy. It's the only real democracy in the Middle East full of all of the rancor and rage and back and forth. Uh, I'm on Israel news every day on my iPad uh, just today, in fact, watching the latest debate and back and forth. But that's really part of the strength of the country. You don't find this in any other country in the Middle East, certainly. Mm -hmm. This is a democracy and it comes with all of the ups and downs that that go along with it. Mm. You know, but here we are. And that leads us to the conversation that I want to have with you, because there's some very significant events, even uh, politics being impacted by this, but the um, the the peace deal that we're literally right on on the verge of seeing here has huge implications, and all of politics with Netanyahu's election, everything that's happening all at once, I don't think has ever happened in our lifetimes uh, as it is right now. Isn't that true? It's a very pivotal moment, certainly in the Middle East, and with potential side effects influence to the whole world, as a matter of fact. 
I mean, what other country on earth that's about the size of New Jersey, which is what Israel happens to be, is on the front pages literally every day. The, the, the impact of this tiny little land geopolitically is just enormous. And we're on the cusp of a lot of very important events. And it just so happens that we have a conservative Republican president in the United States. Mm -hmm. And whatever you think of Donald Trump, he is undoubtedly the best American friend that Israel has ever had as far as the presidency goes. Just incredible. If, if you could just reemphasize this, because sometimes, especially with COVID and all the news, we kind of get away from um, uh, other uh, areas of the world uh, as to whether he's popular or unpopular. Is President Trump as popular as he was when he, he declared uh, uh, Jerusalem to be the, the, the capital? Is he still as popular? Uh, he could probably become prime minister of Israel. Really? He's is so okay. popular. Yeah. So his He's way is more popular in Israel than he is the, in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, last I checked, I think he had an 80% popularity rating in the state of Israel. Mm. And, and he's done a lot to deserve that mm. uh, for a long time. In fact, from the very beginning of the Jewish state in 1948, the United States did not formally recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. This is the eternal, ancient heart of the Jewish people going way back to King David. Yes. And yet, because of the international community and the United Nations and so on, we can't really formally recognize Jerusalem as the Jewish capital. After all, it's divided and there are Arab claims and... Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the Jews took over the western half of the city during their war of independence. So we should all just work this out at some nebulous time in the future. But for now, we'll just have the American embassy, for example, in Tel Aviv mm -hmm. on the Mediterranean coast. Well, Tel Aviv is a great city, but it's not the capital of Israel. And finally, we had an American president. We have an American president with enough beautiful word chutzpah. Yes, sir. Chutzpah. Yes. To say, look, Jerusalem is Israel's capital. It has always been. It always will be. And it is time for the United States of America to recognize it as the capital and to formally move the American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. That is a huge, huge and, development. And I'm, uh, if you don't mind me adding the, uh, enough chutzpah to do exactly what every previous president during our lifetime said that they were going to do enough chutzpah and integrity right. to follow through with the promises that we've always made. Now you, you are the, the off, author of the book, who's Holy land, uh, archeology right. meets geopolitics in today's middle East. And sir, this is where, and, and I've got some political commentary here so you can kind of clean me up a little bit and, and, and kind of educate me and our, our audience will learn through this. But this dispute, uh, with the with the the Palestinians, I see a lot of similarities. For instance, with the plight of the Palestinian, you know, fighting the the, the oppressed regime and blah blah blah. blah. And, and, and no disrespect, but I was actually a little bit sympathetic at one point in time, where I said, "Oh, look at the poor Palestinians! You know, throwing rocks and they don't have any shoes and we're cutting off their medicine. Maybe we need to help them out a little bit." But then I recognized what was being done because I listened to both sides. The Palestinians are, I liken them to the current peaceful protesters that you see out in the streets yeah. today. And they're peaceful literally, protesters. they're literally human shields. And Hamas is mingling in between them. And they are fighting tooth and nail in a dispute that has been going on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. But the, the oppressed Palestinians, are they not being used as human shields in this dispute that, that's going on right now in the Middle East? Pete, I think you pretty well nailed it. Did I really? Wow. You you nailed it. That That's exactly what's going on. Now, we have Hamas, as you mentioned, in the area to the south mm -hmm. of Israel called Gaza, uh, a radical terrorist regime that, in fact, hides behind the civilians of Gaza as, okay, human shields who've been firing rockets for years and years now into Israel proper. And it's interesting Israel actually conquered Gaza in the 1967 Six-Day War. This was basically a defensive war. 
when Israel was attacked, uh, Egypt had closed off uh, Israel's shipping, which was an act of war, and Syria attacked, Jordan attacked, and in basically Israel's blitzkrieg in six days, they conquered the entire Sinai Peninsula, they conquered all of East Jerusalem, and what's called Judea and Samaria, or the West Bank, all the way up to the Jordan River, as well as the Golan Heights. Yes. So they conquered Gaza mm -hmm. and held it for years and years until finally the call went out internationally. And even within Israel, and there's a lot of, as we mentioned, a lot of debate within Israel. It's not unanimous. Why don't we just pull back, you know, let, let the Palestinians have Gaza, and that will show our good faith in moving forward with the peace process, which I call a war process, but th they call it the peace process. So Israel did this. N now, uh, Israelis had moved into parts of Gaza and established small settlements in Gaza mm -hmm. during those years that, that Israel controlled it. And all of them had to be uprooted, evacuated, basically Jewish refugees in their own state in order to give this territory over to the Palestinians mm. who had an election, one election, one time, mm. because they elected Hamas. And from that moment, no more elections. And you have a terror state, which has been, as I mentioned, bombarding the, the southern towns of Israel regularly, repeatedly with rockets. Uh, even today, as I mentioned, I follow Israel news. Th there was a a couple of balloons, they, they, they call them explosive device, explosive balloons. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. I can't imagine. <laughs> air, to float over the border and land within Israel proper yes. uh, on settlements and housing, but, uh, fields, etc. But, sir, there, there, and as a matter of fact, we're going to talk about the, the conflict that we're seeing right now because there's some major, major developments, especially with what happened in... Um, uh, in Beirut as well. That was very, very significant what happened there. But let, let's have that discussion a little bit. Um, help us understand, and you've written about this, um, modern day Palestinians uh, seem to be the front face of the Arab world that is fighting for their piece of the, the Holy Land. And there's that, there, therefore that dispute. Who are the, the people that identify as Palestinians as, as you're right? Who, who are they? Describe who they are. Well, these are sundry Arab tribes who moved into the region over the centuries, beginning with the explosive growth of Islam in the 600s and 700s of the Common Era. Not long after the Prophet Muhammad himself, the, the religion exploded uh, to the west all the way to Spain, conquered everything in their path. And th this little area along the eastern flank of the Mediterranean, Palestine, as it was called, became Arab land. So these people moved in, but the Jews had been living there from, the, as I mentioned, the days of King David, hmm. right? So, so it's actually Arabs who moved in. And yet, under Arab control for many centuries, under the Ottoman Turks, for example, the land was completely neglected. Hmm. It was a malarial infested swamp, was it literally, really? hmm. un until in the 19th century, large numbers of Jewish settlers began to move in to Ottoman Turkish, not Arab now, but Muslim mm -hmm. Palestine in those days, and mm. began to reclaim the land, reclaim those malarial swamps, plant trees. These Jews didn't have a state yet, but they just started to move there because, after all, this is our holy land, yes. our holy land. And it, then, after the land was being reclaimed, more and more Arabs began, began to move in because suddenly mm. it's prosperous again. Mm -hmm. So the majority of the Palestinian population today came in after Jews from Europe started reclaiming the land yes. in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Yes. And, you know, you, you've, you prompted me uh, uh, to do more research because as you laid this out, I'm going to read this just as it's, uh, as it's written here because it struck me. Because the Ottoman Empire and the Ottoman Turks, they were very, very powerful. And through, obviously, conquest, even to this day, they're trying to achieve their their caliphate through through conquest. Fortunately, we, we've been able to oppose it. But the Ottomans took that land from the, the Mamluks, who took it from the Ayyubids, who took it from the Crusaders, 
who took it from the Seljuks, who took it from the Fatimids, who took it from the Abbasids, who took it from the Byzantines and the Romans, who took it from, took it from the, the Jews. Jews. You're reading right from my book. I'm That's reading exactly, right, exactly. what happened through history. But this is what you say, sir. The archaeological records state what I just read. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, somebody said, you want to learn about America? Take a good book. You want to learn about the land of Israel? Take a shovel. Because all you have to do is dig down, and mm. you will find evidence everywhere of the ancient holy land of Israel mm -hmm. and who lived there from time immemorial. And many Jews today simply want to live in these places again. Mm -hmm. They want to live in East Jerusalem, for example. Mm -hmm. this, this is the most important, holiest site in all of Judaism. This is the wall, the Western wall, for mm -hmm. goodness sakes, mm -hmm. and the ancient Jewish quarter. And yet, technically speaking, East Jerusalem is supposed to be part of a future Palestinian state. Mm. In other words, if the UN had its druthers, Jerusalem would be divided again. It would become the Berlin mm. of the Middle East, mm -hmm. seriously. Mm -hmm. And all the Jews who live near the wall, in fact, the wall itself w would be taken away from the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. yes, the the Jews who live in East Jerusalem would have to be evacuated. Well, that's all right. That's all right. And we'll have a border right through the center of the city. Divided cities are ugly. Mm. And as, as a matter of fact, there used to be a no man's land right through the center of Jerusalem from 1948 mm. to 1967. Mm -hmm. uh, a friend of mine, when I, I lived in Israel for years, and a friend of mine was a Christian pastor who had been there for some 40 years during the British mandate period. And he was rescuing a little Arab child who had gotten off on the wrong side of divided Jerusalem, trying to get him back to his own family on the east side. Mm. He had to cross this minefield, mm -hmm. and my friend stepped on a landmine. Oh, did he really? Wow. He blew mm. his leg off, oh, literally. Oh, my goodness. Wow. That's the reality of divided cities. Mm -hmm. But that's all right, because mm. that's what we call the peace process. Let's divide Jerusalem. Let's divide the Holy Land. Mm. And let's have a Palestinian state which would in fact be another version of gaza mm. we've seen what happened to gaza when you r withdraw yes uh, f from territory you want that now uh, on the outskirts of tel aviv and mm. in half of jerusalem that's what's wanted well, th well thank goodness we have a united states president who sees things a little differently and we also have an israeli prime minister who mm. sees things a lot differently mm -hmm. sir i uh, yeah, i wanted to have this discussion with you um in the the remaining balance of our discussion here, but of course, uh, cover uh, what's going on in the Middle East right now. It's, things are escalating as we as we see. But sir, I met someone. I consider him to be, you know, my brother. He's like a brother to me, and he's a Messianic Jew uh, who became a um, a student of Kabbalah. Now, I wanted to speak about Kabbalah because most people don't know about Kabbalah uh, and how it relates to current geopolitics because we have some very influential people even within our our government that are practicing Kabbalists um Jared Kushner Ivanka mm -hmm. Trump both mm -hmm. that yeah. are doing absolutely outstanding work as uh you know for for President Trump's administration but who are the Kabbalists what can you tell our listening audience about who the Kabbalists are well actually I wrote a separate book on Kabbalah did you fact. really okay uh yeah yeah a uh, Kabbalah or Kabbalah, however you want to Kabbalah. pronounce it. Mm -hmm. the, the, the word itself, it's a Hebrew word. It means received, mm -hmm. that which is received. Mm -hmm. And it basically is all about mysticism, mm -hmm. mystical practices that bring us closer to the, the divine presence, however we understand that. And the, the idea is that the divine presence, mm -hmm. let's call let's say God, emanates into yes. the world right. in various ways ways and various means through various emanations that involve both compassion on the one hand and severity mm -hmm. on the other mm -hmm. and that these two things are actually balanced mm -hmm. so that there is i like this expression there is nothing lost in god's economy mm -hmm. and, and, and the way it's been described to me entire, working out Correct me if I'm wrong. This is what I do understand because uh, as I describe myself to be a spiritual being and I've always understood this um because we have 
different levels of our uh, awakening uh, and our connectivity uh, to our God. Um, mm-hmm. And that spiritual connection, you would, you advance at certain stages. And then there is an undeniable connection between our souls. Our physical bodies are nothing compared uh, to what we have in our souls and in our God that we know created us and we will one day uh, join uh, for eternal life. So I understand uh, Kabbalah as that, that, that progression, that, that awakening and that spiritual connectivity and that closer connection to God. Is that, is that like an escalated level per se? Is that a correct understanding? I think you nailed it again. Oh, <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, there, there is a mystical trend actually through all of the major religions of the world. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it's been said on an academic level that the world religions really, you, you, People say they all point in the same direction. Actually, they don't. They're all over the place. And theology is different, and it's, it's radically opposed one to another, etc. But if you want to find some golden thread and some real commonality, don't look at doctrines, don't look at all the theological points, but if you look on the mystical level, yeah. and, and there have been Christian Kabbalists, let's call them, mystics down yeah. through the ages. And yeah. I discussed that in one of my books as, as well, and Catholic ones as well. Uh, uh, if you could discuss it, because there is some, I, I would say the best way to um, um, to describe the resistance that people have to even that word mysticism, because of what I understand in knowing, you know, my brother who who taught me, he, he, he said you, you have to really fine-tune your soul you have to advance to the next level to have just a a a, um, a spirit of reception and your connection uh, to god but when when we refer to mysticism and all of a sudden you get people that go off on a tangent start talking about it's a cult it's this it's that those are people that are not fully understanding exactly what it is so describe that mysticism if you would for somebody that just doesn't they just don't know uh, and they're resistant to it Well, as I mentioned, everything is in balance in mystical tradition, in in Kabbalah. Uh, Compassion, severity, but also the concept of pure wisdom and spirituality Mm -hmm. is balanced, on the other hand, by rationality. Mm -hmm. And you cannot have one without the other. And the people who get off on a deep end or out on a limb, uh, et cetera, are are those who have forgotten the rationality that must be mingled Mm -hmm. with the spirituality. Mm -hmm. Uh, In in fact, there's there's a teaching that you you should not and must not enter the orchard of mysticism. This this is rabbinic teaching. Um, Unless you are at least 40 years old and have a full belly, which means you really know your Bible, you mm-hmm. really know your Torah, the, mm-hmm. the books of Moses, and have really studied. Because otherwise, in fact, there's also a story of four rabbis who went into the mystical orchard, and one of them lost his mind, another one was burned. Only one of them came out untouched. Mm. Because, because you have to be prepared. You have to yes. be prepared. And, right. and there's people who are just looking for some experience uh, who uh, ultimately can, can, in fact, easily be led astray. Yeah, seeking higher power versus uh, higher knowledge. Yeah. Right? There you go. It's that, that, yeah. that, becomes, that becomes dangerous. Um, so, sir, the, um, the, as, we, as we wind down here, the, the, the Holy Land, every person hearing our voice right now could be. I mean, we have a large Jewish audience, Christian audience. Um, we all believe that the Holy Land is something very, very special. There is a, a military battle that's going on right now. Of course, some very significant events that are taking place. But ultimately, how are we to respond as ultimately in the Bible, uh, in the book of Revelations, that, that, that final battle of Armageddon will take place uh, in the Middle East? I believe that we're headed in that direction. Obviously, we are. Um, uh, will it happen in our lifetime? You know, God only knows, of course. Um, but what are what are we to what are we to um, expect that is written in the Torah or the Bible as to how we're to defend the Holy Land? What is God's commandments as to what to we're, what we're to do uh, through these conflicts? Well, the Jewish faith is actually pretty optimistic 
we like to look on the bright side. Uh, somebody asked the rabbi, when will the Messiah come? come? And the rabbi answered, when, when we make the world ready to receive him. Mm -hmm. it's, it's our job. We've right. got to make the world a place that is worthy of the Messiah coming. Mm -hmm. Now, there is also a teaching that before the Messiah comes, you mentioned the book of Revelation in Christianity, but in Judaism, there's a term called Chevlei HaMashiach. Mm -hmm. which literally means the pangs mm -hmm. of the Messiah, mm -hmm. like birth pangs. Mm -hmm. that, that, yeah, there will be a time of trouble. There will be a time of, of travail, of pain, of falling away before the Messiah comes. And that's what we must be uh, vigilant about, but always doing what we can to improve the situation, to mm -hmm. make things better. Mm -hmm. And that is all over the Torah. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the Torah, the books of Moses are remarkably, let's call them progressive, mm -hmm. good, good modern word, but they are, mm -hmm. b b because unlike other ancient law codes, um, they, the, the Torah looks for a compassion. It, it looks for a, a, a human touch in all of our dealings, and it looks for honesty, for justice, for rightness, for, for, for meeting out justice appropriately. And, you know, it's no accident that the state of Israel is first on the scene whenever there is an international catastrophe. Mm -hmm. When 9-11 took place, who was there first with search dogs uh, going through the rubble? The state of Israel. Teams of doctors on the scene. Mm -hmm. Just in the last days, Israel has offered help and aid to Lebanon in the midst of this horrific explosion. Mm -hmm. And and even today, as I'm, as I'm uh, wa watching the news from Israel, they're talking about using the port of Haifa in Israel to allow grain shipments to come in that can be sent up to Lebanon because their entire port was destroyed. Oh, right, right. Wow. Uh, so there's a humanitarian impact, obviously. With the port Absolutely. being Absolutely. Yes. In spite of the fact that they hate us, that they want to, that they, they've got 150,000 missiles in Lebanon pointed mm -hmm. at us in the state of Israel. Yeah. We, we will do what we can mm -hmm. to make the world a, a better place to receive, to receive one day in mm -hmm. God's will, the, the Messianic King. Sometimes I get frustrated uh, watching, you know, um, worldly events as uh, the IDF standing and they and they know that the Palestinians that are throwing rocks they're they're harmless people the peaceful protesters that are being used as human shields but they operate with such considering who they're surrounded by who want to wipe them off the face of the map they operate with such restraint and sometimes i think that that just is almost adding fuel to the fire but they but they do um and i i uh i see them operating with tremendous restraint and as you're describing with charity, even, um, yes. uh, and generosity exactly. and compassion for, you know, for even their, their enemies who want to kill them. Exactly. Yes. That's right. Wow. Um, sir, the, um, God commands us to, uh, to defend and protect the Holy land ultimately, right? All of us, Christians and Jews, correct? Amen. <laughs> right. That's what this, yes. what, what do you think is going to happen in the coming days? A and as we described, um, preparation, uh, does that have everything to do with why the Jews have um, symbolically prepared for, um, uh, for the coming of the Messiah with the third temple? Is that a significant thing? Because they're, they're fully prepared, are they not, with the third, the ter third temple? Uh, there is a whole institute, in fact. It's called the Temple Institute mm -hmm. that, that has for years, decades now, been manufacturing the items required yes. for sacrifice in the temple when it is finally rebuilt in the Messianic age, priestly garments. There's a huge golden menorah where mm -hmm. you go visit Jerusalem today as a tourist. There, there it is on your approach to the Western Wall. It's huge and, and glass, in, inside a glass case, uh, seven branch candelabra, the menorah. All this is ready. All mm -hmm. this is ready. Uh, of course, is, most Israelis are not exactly that religious. They're secular. And as I mentioned, huge debate within Israel right now. What should Israel do? There is a historic opportunity to extend Israeli law and sovereignty over the Israeli settlement blocks mm -hmm. in the West Bank. Will Israel have the chutzpah to do it? That's the question. Yes, sir. Um, 
Very uh, interesting times. Uh, indeed, and a lot of people say that these are the end times and only, you know, it would be, of course, on God's timeline, of course. But, sir, uh, thank you very much for your first visit. I'd like to invite you to come back on. There's so much more that we need to talk about. But uh, there's a lot. Dr. Hansen, yeah, thank you. It's be been a pleasure. An honor. I, I hope you enjoyed the conversation. From a, Very much. Very uh, much, Pete. Thank Good you. to be with you. Thank you. Good to be with you, too. We'll be right back, folks. a drill. Right now, what we're seeing behind the scenes is flat out election meddling. Google now blacklisting non-mainstream news sites. They've removed a large number of news sites from search pages on Tuesday morning. Breitbart, Daily Caller, National Pulse. Your news feed is fake. It's a fake feed. You will be disconnected from us. We're getting 20, 30,000 clicks. They're going to shut us down. They send their trolls in. They can't have you listening to Tucker Carlson. Here's what you need to recognize. It's not Tucker getting deleted. It's not Gavin McInnes. It's not Alex Jones. It's not Laura Loomer. It's not those people that are getting deleted. There's a patriotic spirit in America that can never be conquered. And it's time to start emphasizing our national pride by supporting our police, U.S. military, first responders, and our U.S. Constitution. For a limited time, we're giving away collector's coins to support our national heroes and American gun owners who believe in the importance of the Second Amendment. Go to Pete'sPatriotCoins.com and get your coins today. While supplies last, you can get the 2020 Punisher coin, the police coin, the firefighter coin, the navy coin, and my favorite, the Second Amendment gold coin. These coins originally retail at $39.99, and they're giving them away. All you have to do is cover $6.95 for shipping and handling, but you have to act quickly. While supplies last, we're giving them away, and all you have to do is cover the shipping and handling. Visit Pete'sPatriotCoins.com. That's Pete'sPatriotCoins.com. Huh?